Okay, um, as Tony mentioned before, um, this year we had a really good response to the call for presenters and one of the great things is that for the last couple of years it's been the same people getting up to speak. Um, we've had some interesting stories, um, it's, it's been great to watch. This year uh, we've got some new people. Um, Murray Buscanyan is one of those people. Uh, Murray is the Matt Casper admin here at UTS, so uh, thanks from AUC and XWorld for hosting us here, Murray. Um, this is Murray's first time presenting at XWorld, um, and he's going to be talking about, which is quite appropriate before lunch, uh, No Machine, the secret source for Big Mac. So <laughs> over to Murray. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, very, everybody. And, um, uh, well, yeah, actually, it's my first presentation ever. Uh, I've been coming to the XWorld before. Um, when the call for presenters was just raised that we got the emails, my boss got the email, and it says, hey, you should present here. I said, no, there's no way. What am I going to talk about? Well, we've been working on that project. I, was, oh, I don't know. No, it's not going to happen. Well, here I am. So uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, No Machine, the secret source for a Big Mac, and I'm sorry to disappoint you. It has nothing to do with McDonald's. Actually. It's referring to a pile of Mac Minis connected with a software called No Machine. And in the next few minutes, I'll be talking about my experience setting up this system, which is still a work in progress, um, the motivation to start with this, and also the challenges, starting with what type of software we're going to be using. Because as I put it in the title, No Machine, I want to emphasize that it's not my intention to promote the use of this software because I'm aware there might be some of the products out there in the market that can do the same or even better. But we're going to be, or I am going to be focusing mainly in my experience, as I said before. Uh, well, just been said that I'm working for um, the University of Technology Sydney in here and in the desktop management group and the labs group, which is the same actually. Uh, we are in charge of uh, managing all of the computers and computers, end user computers in the whole university. So we look after the imaging, packaging, and enforcing policies, and everything that needs to go down to a computer, it's because of us. Then you have the support that it just looks after all the parts. Uh, tools that we're using at the moment, it's uh, SCCM for Windows. Casper Suite of Jump Pro, I'm, I'm not quite sure what it's called now, but I've, that's what I've <laughs> we're using for Macs. And uh, of course, like Apple Remote Desktops and uh, Desktop and SSH. Uh, so I'm going to just have to give you guys like a bit of a background on the environment in here. So, so we can see how, how the Macs are like, uh, against Windows computers. So we have 22% like, of Mac uh, devices in here. And, against 78% of the windows. We're not currently managing any iPads or any iPhones or mobile devices for, for any kind, but uh, that might change in the future, but still no plans ahead. So we have a, a, approximately, this is all approximately 8,500 8, computer species. A bit over 400 computers, they are running a Linux VM simultaneously with Windows. And this is only for a, com a few computer labs in the Faculty of Engineering and IT. So this is required for the classes, for the study. And we have a, about 2,400 Macs computers. That's including for the staff and uh, software. So what about the students, computer storage for students? More and more students, or if not all of them, have their own computers. So they come to the university with their own laptops and. Uh, they do the work. But on top of that, we need to provide the, the space for teaching and learning and space for students who don't have a computer or they need to access certain applications that they just either can't afford or they don't, can't be bothered or it's a requirement for them to go through the, the studies. 
So we have uh, different labs in here. So the main one we look after is the General Access Computer Lab, which I'm focusing on this one because, as the name says, is General Access. Allows any student with a current or an active account or starting undertaking any course across the university to, to use it. We have a spe specialty labs as well that is going to be a, only for students who are undertaking a course or the faculty labs, which is going to be, for instance, here in DAB, that only students who are enrolled at DAB can use them. So general access, it's, it's very broad. So you need to look after pretty much every single angle because any student can use it and we need to provide the service. So with this responsibility comes, <laughs> It's the other way around with this power. <laughs> a bit of big responsibility. So there's a bit of caveats in here. So this probably like difficulties for students who need who need to use a specific resources and if we by location. I mean it doesn't sound like a big deal, like the student has to just walk into the lab and, uh, and start using a computer. But the, the fact is, the student needs to use that computer because the computer has something that he needs, especially an application. And because of this, they are subject to availability. So, uh, so sometimes, because these are general access computer labs, they are set up for the teaching and learning. There are classes going on. So then students can't use it freely unless they are undertaking the course and they're in the class list. So if they need to do something, finish a project, or they really need to use it urgently, they need to wait because they, they, there's no other choices. By the way, I, I need to warn you, like, this is just a bracket. Like, I've been accused of being a mumbler several times by my wife, so if <laughs> she says mumbler. So I'm trying to modulate as better, as good as possible. So if you don't understand something, anything, you can ask the person next to you. If not, <laughs> Just interrupt me, please. <laughs> oh, so the availability. So we have these solutions. And the other one is BYOD, but this is what it entails because uh, it's going to be, well, the, the own computer for, from the student, just bringing it over. But you had to provide something for them. So the infrastructure, and, uh, the main thing is it would be Wi-Fi. So they can connect to the internet on the university network. Common areas, so they can have student lounges and tables or cooperation areas, so that when they can discuss the topics, and of course, uh, printing has to be available for uh, for them in their own computers. So that's all been covered, and this shouldn't be a big deal with uh, all of the. It wouldn't matter with what type of computer they're using, which is. Uh, I don't have really the numbers, but every time I walk around across the university and I go through the student lounges, I see that most of them are using Mac, Mac computers, Mac, MacBook Pros, MacBook Airs, or, uh, and it's because it's, I don't know, maybe it's becoming trendy within students, but most of the computers we have at the university, they're Windows, but you can see, I mean visually, maybe it's an impression, maybe it's just me trying to pick apples when I'm walking by, but. I see this, and uh, it leads me to question myself to wonder why people prefer Macs. And I say because Macs are cool, and they're beautiful computers. So, but there might be another reason why they're going to be using it. And, and this is uh, like the, the most important, I guess. They, need, they, need, they want to use Mac OS. And they, run, they want to run any of the AS applications there, Mac OS only. And the, the main one that I, I want to focus on today, it's the apps development with Xcode. Xcode, as you might know, it needs developer access to run and to compile applications when you are working on it. So standard users, they're going to be asked for administration password to elevate their access to be a developers. So with this, we wonder like, what can you do as a developer? What's the damage? So 
In fact, we need to do it. We can't say no. So we decided to just put it, give the developer access to a limited number of computers. So that is restricting a bit more. So there are people, as I was saying before, some students or a lot of students have their own laptops, their own Macs, because they're coming here and I can see that they're using them. But sometimes they, there's some cases that some students might just buy the smallest hard drive. As you may know as well with Xcode, it's once you expand it, it's like about 10 gigs or 11 gigs, plus the library, which would be like another five gigs, I can't remember exactly from memory. So if you have a hard drive of 128 gigs, you have to be like a very conscious about what you're gonna be installing. So if you're gonna be dedicating yourself to app development, then yeah, fair enough, go for it. If you just need to just pass the course, the class that it's gonna take an exam or a couple of works, like maybe it's not a good idea. So then you have those people that they have the Macs, but they're not gonna be using Xcode in the computers. And we also have the students who don't own a Mac. So then how, how do we approach this? How do we, because they can go obviously to the computer lab, but we have only two computers left. The, it will be 70 seats in total. Last time I heard from every turn, people undertaking uh, app development, which in, involves Xcode, it's about 130 students per term. And um, this doesn't really cut it in, in case, because there's all the classes that they're going in here. So we came up with the idea of uh, how about a remote resource? And so we thought like, well, that's great. So if we put like a remote resource for students to access over the network, of course, that it's gonna be simple, multi-platform, that it doesn't matter what computer they're using, they can connect to it because the Wi-Fi is already established in here. Um, I've heard some people are saying that it's pretty fast, it's pretty good. I have nothing to do with the wireless anyway. And something that is compatible with any software. Uh, that's saying that compa not compatible with any software, it means that we can use just a normal web browser to access and uh, connect remotely to this resource, which is like perfect because uh, nobody needs to install anything. Just go into the URL, accept the certificate, and here we go. So we decided to go with no machine. And why no machine? As I was saying before, like we don't want to promote it, but it's, it gives you the cloud server, and that's uh, what I was just saying before. Enables the user to connect to it via web browser. So if, you, if you're running Windows and you want to connect to with uh, Internet Explorer, you can. And you can with Firefox and any other browser. And that's the beauty of it. We, we have experience with this because we're using it in the Faculty of uh, Engineering and IT. I mean, it's still in use, but in uh, VMware, I mean, in, uh, sorry, not VMware, in a virtual environments in, uh, with a Linux. So there's uh, different virtual machines that they, they can be connected to. Um, and it was a fair price because we already were customers. So we didn't have to really shop around much. So how does this work? Very simple, one computer, for the cloud server, it just can be like any Mac, pretty much. Well, depending how many how many connections you're gonna be allowing, you might wanna have like a, in our case, we have an i7 with uh, 16 gig of RAM. Just for the, for the server, you can put, I believe, two, or I don't know if more than two, but it won't fail over, for sure. And, uh, and then you have the nodes, which are gonna be the rest of Mac minis. So, this configuration is for Mac OS. The, this doesn't allow it to be virtual, unfortunately, so it has to be physical. So this, uh, yeah, I'm trying to make the clear because the, with the no machine software, there's, um, there's lots of things that you can do with uh, virtual machines if you have a virtual environment and very much way limited when it's physical. This is one of, one of the caveats. So, we need to put this together 
And because it's physical, well, we, we want students to start using it, but we don't want three students. We want a, a bit more students to be using it. They want this to be popular. And this comes together with some challenges because uh, the university at the moment, they're trying to cut down in hardware. They're trying to move into, full, uh, into virtual. So most of the services that they've been created, if not all of them, they are virtual. So when you come to, to them and say, well, I need this in the server room, what is it? Uh, it is some, a, a bunch of Mac minis that we have, well, there's not that many. And uh, said, so, well, we don't want to have more hardware. Have you heard about it? Well, we, we kind of need it because uh, we, I should have done a presentation for them, but uh, uh, well, they didn't think it through clearly. So we came up with uh, 24 Mac Minis. It looks exactly like that. Now, I didn't want to take photos because it looks awful, but oh, <laughs> and the server on top, yeah. <laughs> So, they, it, this didn't come down very well, and it took a lot of uh, pushing and pulling to get into it, and uh, God. That's one of the biggest challenges, is dealing with these people. I mean, not these people, but you had to cut that. <laughs> There's nobody here <laughs> from UTS, <laughs> which is pretty good. <laughs> Phone room to house the 25 computers. That, that took a long time. It took um, months and months. It was close to the year. So once they, after you find that you had to start getting the network, the right subnet and for the configuration, because uh, you need this to work fine, and you need the computer, the server to talk to the nodes freely. And uh, this is the most painful one. The firewall settings. The policy in UTS is, OK, you have a subnet in here, and it's not going to work because everything is blocked. So what do you need? Uh, I need to access the internet. OK, what ports to connect to where? OK, it's a bit more than that. So, and so it's come and go. No, it can't be done because there's network. No, network. No, it's a firewall. No, it can't be done. So. That, that was a, a big, big challenge. So I'm going to go here now like to, the, to show a bit of the protocol. This is the, the GUI settings from the, from the server. And as you can see, like, it, it runs its, its own protocol that it's called the, the first one is the NX. The NX, it's a, it's a very clever thing, actually. But it can do, as I said before, it can do way more in a virtual environment on Linux than in the Mac OS. And it uses, it connects to also through the, through the web on a secure layer or, or an open one. And it's a sage. This is how it initiates a connection. When you're binding or, or joining a node to the server, it's going to ask, it's going to create, generate a key, like an RSA key. And that's how it's connected to, this, to the nodes from the server. And it creates an account that is called NX, and it's a hidden system account that it just controls uh, the remote resource. It's, it's quite clever the way it's been done. Uh, so it comes with uh, the CLI as well. And it's all reduced to just one command and several, several, several flags. So for instance, this is, this is what happens if you type help. So you, you can start scrolling. And the help is very concise. And it's very, very specific. And it tells you pretty much everything. So what I did, I just copied it and pasted it and created a PDF and I started reading through it. Because uh, it goes and goes on. One of the problems is that most of the commands and the, the flags, they are for virtual environment only. So you try to use them in a, in a physical environment like this, and it doesn't work. Because um, one of the selling points was as well is the, the round robin technology for load balancing. And uh, it's not supported in a virtual environment. So we need to go through that again to, like, to see where we're going to go, what we're going to be doing. Um, so some of the things are, that you can easily do with uh, command line is 
adding notes, which is much quicker than doing it. If you're doing it through the GUI, it takes forever. It's like a million clicks. With this one, you can just, uh, just start pushing commands. You can add users to the, to the cluster, so they can be given different access rights to, to see what they're going to be doing. Uh, restart the update the license, uh, enable disable access for users and groups, um, modify rules with the rules so you can uh, do the multi-node, set multi-node environment, um, stuff like that, or uh, allow or disallow um, concurrent connections to a computer, and et cetera. I haven't gone through all of that, or we can have all day. So here I've got like a, a clip to just show how it works. So. This is just with uh, Safari. Uh, so you, you type Xcode. Uh, we, we just set up the DNS for, the, for our results. And then just don't take note of that. Just look away. So when you get there for the first time, you, you see something like this. It's just one physical display because it says my desktop. That's the default. And then you have to go and up, just browse and get the all desktops. And then you can modify the view to make it a bit um, easier. So you have like, three settings of views. And uh, it's telling you what, which display is going to go. The, it shows a display in case of this going to pop. It, I think that's the default for the virtual environments when you can connect to different displays and then you, don't, you can go on top of somebody else and without noticing. Um, just connecting to that one. Oh, you can, yeah, you can scroll there. Like the notes, so it can be configured. The names, you can name it whatever you want. And you can make it visible or invisible. For, you can get rid of this, with everything through the command line if you want, like, so people don't have uh, this introduction sort of uh, showing what you do in case if they want to change the resolution or stuff like that. Uh, yeah, that's uh, about the same, the resolution. Uh, that's just from the, from the browser now, so then connecting to you through, like, just using an uh, Active Directory authentication. Just let you in. And what happens there now, like it's kind of stuck in there. Uh, there is a bit of a glitch at the moment, and, uh, and I, I'm not sure if it's had to do something with uh, the new environment that I set it up, but that's meant to be showing the Casper bubbles saying checking for policies. But uh, at the logging moment, no machine doesn't want to show anything else. It just wants to show the, the screen once you're logged on. It didn't happen before it started happening recently, and I've been just scratching my head like I'm trying to see what the problem is. Because you're, you're going to see in a minute. Well, this is the, all of the menu. The icon at the, at the top, just it can give you, it can show all of the computers that are there, but I, I decided to just remove it so people wouldn't, wouldn't go through all the computers and uh, piggyback on connections, because I think it is possible which is a bit of a problem. And this is a client. This is just running the NX. The NX protocol connects on port 40, 4,000, sorry, to, to the server. And that's all it's doing. And here you go, like, just not gonna use that. And uh, and that's a bubble that it should be showing at the beginning when it's logging in, but it's, it doesn't do it. And this is the, this is the app. It looks uh, very similar, but the, the difference is the settings. You can go on settings at the top and start trying to configure differently the type of connection that you're going to have. Because in some scenarios, if you're not able to connect via the NX protocol, you can change it to SSH. And and the system is going to try to connect you to the to the server via SSH, creating a, a tunnel. It didn't work that well for me. And this is it. Like I just logged on, and and this is quite cool because uh, when you log in for the first time, the in the server it creates a configuration file with your user, and it remembers 
the settings. So if you change the list view in any way, the next time you log in using the app or any other browser, it's going to remember, it's going to show you the same list view that you were using before. It's just a simple CFG file. Uh, and that's, uh, yeah, well, that's about the same too. Like it looks like in the, in the web browser. Well, as I was saying, this is still a work in progress, so we don't have it fully functional. I uh, need to go through a lot of things before we can start advertising. But I think that the system can do a lot of things, uh, good things. Uh, we already have the hardware, we have it in place, so we just need to continue fighting for throwing water to the firewall. I don't know, we're gonna start doing things. Uh, well, to finish this, to disconnect, I mean, you don't need to log off, but I've, it's recommended in this case, or I've got it set up to log off in idle, but you just finish the session, you just close the window like that. So, uh, God, I, I think I did um, a bit shorter than I thought, so... I'm gonna just go for any questions. <laughs> Easy questions, please. Not trying to be the question guy. Um, so uh, a question for me, I guess, is when you go into the into the environment, either by the web browser or, or whatever, are you limited to the number of physical Mac minis that you have as a number of connections, or is it virtual? Is it using the Mac minis to virtualize uh, a, a limited or unlimited number of desktops? Does that make sense? Yeah, this is uh, physical, it makes sense. So, the so, number so you a see person is, logs into a... In a mini. computer, yeah. Okay. So with the, as I was saying, with the rules that you can add, you can turn it on and off if you want people to, more than you want user to connect at the same time. The problem is it doesn't create a virtual display for them. It's just gonna piggyback and get it two people screen sharing the same thing. So you, uh, as I was saying, you can do that in a virtual environment, and it's easy. So on this case, I don't know. I think um, because of I haven't done it yet because I'm trying to go through all the problems. But at this time, what I'm going to do is just like create a login script to add a rule and remove the node from the console. So when another user goes in, can't see it, so it can't accidentally try to log in because. Uh, if you create a rule to allow only one person, then the other person is gonna to try to connect and it's gonna give him an error. And it's an error that it's not very clear. Like, oh, this computer has been used, like you choose another one. Well, it's just stupid, I mean, anyway, like you should be able to just double click and just connect to whatever, so. So oh, what I wanna see is like, if uh, there's 23 people using computers, it's gonna be one available then, and then somebody else, the 24th person is gonna go in there and I've just see one computer, okay, I'm gonna take it, and that's it. Uh, uh, maybe to add to that thought is, I guess there are lots of virtualization tools on Mac to virtualize on Mac hardware, so maybe that might be an avenue you could explore that if you need needed yeah. more seats per, per machine, you could do it that way. We thought about it, because I, I was thinking also, because when, when you use uh, ARD or the VNC, now this profit you, if somebody's using it, if you want to share the screen or uh, log in with your own account. So I just wanted to go through that way, maybe. And it's a, it's a good tip, thanks. G'day, Maury. Um, hey. <laughs> I, I'm pretty curious about this. How have you found the, I've never actually come across this product before, so I'm asking more about what you, um, what you've had to do around pricing, you know, for 20, was it 24 Mac Minis you've got going there? How does yeah, the licensing work? It's 24 in total. How so does, we had a yeah. subscription per year and um, it's a server license. And then there's, uh, there's uh, the nodes that is called, it's the desktop um, application, which, which is uh, a bit cheaper. So it's another subscription and uh, you get it per ranges. It's like, um, I'm pretty sure it's by tens. So you can buy a license per 10 units for nodes. So you're paying for the the actual nodes, not the amount of users that are logging in? Exactly. Right. Yeah, the number of, uh, w how, in how many devices have installed the, the software. And uh, we came across to this because uh, 
Before I started working for the, the desktop management group, um, I was just working for the faculty. And, and people who are in the desktop management, they were working for another faculty, <laughs> for engineering and IT. But UTS started with the program of uh, trying to centralize everything. So lots of services and things that came back together in, into one part. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I've been moved and they moved and we met each other. So then they've been using it for years in, uh, over there but with a virtual environment with Linux. So students can log in. If they had a Linux with, um, I can't remember, I, I couldn't tell you how many virtual instances that they, students can, can access remotely. And it's been working fantastically. So everybody had a good experience with it. So honestly, we didn't do much research when we came to the Macs. So we said, well, let's use the same product. But then on the go, I started realizing, well, actually, you can't do this. You could do it with the other one. And another thing that is comes quite an eye on is when you go into the, the website, the support website, and start looking for like, tips or how to do something, you come switch, uh, across something cool, and then it says only for virtual environment. Mm -hmm. And then the Max, is, it's all pulled all together. So there's not like a section to say what you can do with Max for physical, physical desktops. I did had one more question. Um, uh, is there an ability to <coughs> move files from the remote host to the local machine? Yes. And you can print and you can install USB keys and all of this stuff. It's supported. So, so you you can plug in a USB key yes. locally that'll travel through. Oh, you, the can, you can you uh, can you can stream sound as well. Pretty cool. Thanks. Yep. <laughs> um, I've got a question. Um, how have you found stability of the product? Stability. Yeah. Oh, God. I couldn't say because uh, when we started working on it, uh, I had it in um, in the back room let's say, and they were piled up with, a, with an old switch. And that's when it was working the best. <laughs> <laughs> now it's in the server room, and uh, oh, oh, every day there's something different. And, uh, and I've been trying to sort everything out. And uh, it's easy, I know it's easy to blame the firewall for everything, because they are the bad guys. But it may not be. It may be something else. And, I've, and it's really hard. Like when. Um, no machine is not very good with uh, error codes. So for instance, once I was having a problem with the license, the license was expired, and I couldn't use the computers. And, and I looked everywhere until I had to contact support, and they told me to send some logs over there. And I was looking at the logs before sending them, and then I realized it, it wasn't a, a, a licensing issue, but it was a certificate issue. So the computers weren't talking, they weren't trusting each other for whatever reason they broke, I can't remember. And then I just had to recreate those keys, I deleted all of the keys, and then create the new ones, and everything was working fine. So it's, it's a lot of work, actually, in terms of trying to get it properly working, but I don't know, it's still a work in progress, as I said, so maybe for Another session, another year. <laughs> I want to show the experience. Have, have you spoken to the students that are using it about what the experience has been compared to actually using uh, a machine in front of them? Um, well, that's a, that's a point because uh, the students don't have access yet, so there's no feedback because we're trying to sort out some of the problems before. And uh, and that's or another conversation I had with my boss when he was saying, well, "We just do a presentation on this." I said, "But it's not working properly. It's not ready before the." Before I started this, the thing wasn't, oh, I put everything in a video because I was afraid that something was going to happen. I want to do a demonstration and then nothing works. <laughs> oh, okay. What, what's, your, what's your experience been using one of the machines um, compared to running Xcode or launching Xcode um, on, on the machine in front of you? Is it? Oh, it, it is good. Yeah. Yeah, because of. Depends on the setup, for instance, if, if you leave it running and you, you're logged in and you leave a task running, then you can just start disconnect from no machine and then uh, go back in there and uh, look at it again and then it's still doing it. So I don't know if it, the, it can be do, done, like it could be really useful, I mean, for the movies, like when uh, they're like, um, 
what do you call this? It's not compiling. Uh, rendering. rendering. When you're rendering movies. So we thought about putting like a computers with bigger guts over there and uh, just people can just connect and uh, start rendering stuff and then forget about it. And then come back later, pick up the result. Uh, any more questions? Have five more minutes worth of questions. Okay, in the meantime, I want to leave uh, my dog. <laughs> <laughs> he can answer the questions. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well, thanks, thanks very much, Mori. And I think um, for anybody else that's considering um, doing a presentation for the first time, I think you've shown that for your first time speaking in front of an audience, you've done fantastically well. So oh, thank you. it's not that hard. <laughs> thank you so much. Actually, it's really hard. Yeah. I'm very easy. <laughs>